So it's about two minutes after, and we want to be really respectful of your time. Again, we're really excited to have you today for our month, March uh, uh, iteration of the All American Cities uh, monthly webinar series being hosted by uh, the National Civic League. This month series is on community solutions for addressing disparities and mental health care access. We are um, really excited with the slate of guests that we have here today uh, to talk about these ongoing challenges in our communities and community-based solutions. So we look forward to uh, having this discussion. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we go ahead and get started. So um, once again, I want to highlight the uh, 2022 All-American Cities Awards. The applications were due on March 1st, um, and we're going to be announcing our finalists in early May with the live event happening virtually on um, July 18th, July 22nd. Um, this is our flagship program and one of the ways that we've honestly continued to um, lift up our communities across the United States who are doing excellent uh, civic engagement work. So we really encourage you uh, to tune in in July to hear about what communities across the country have been up to, um, which is really exciting because also at the All-American Cities Awards, we will also be announcing the winner of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the National Civic League Health Equity Award. Um, and so this award seeks to recognize individuals who have successfully successfully implemented change approaches to improving health outcomes in their communities that are impacted by the social determinants of health. Um, and so these are this award seeks to honor one to two individuals at most who've done ongoing and continued work over the past two years in the issues of access to healthcare, education, employment, income, community environment, house, um, and housing and public safety. So if you um, are doing work in one of these areas, or if you know someone who's doing work in one of these areas, we would really encourage you to nominate them for this award. It comes with a $3,000 honorarium um, and is a really great way to honor this work that's being done in our communities. Um, at the bottom of this slide, I've shared once again the due date, which is April 15th at 11.59 PM. And that uh, application is going to be due to me. I've got my email address there. Um, but you can learn more information about this award, including all of the rules, how to submit, um, and really about the history of the award, including past winners, by going to nationalcivicleague.org. Okay, um, and so again, really exciting. Hope that some of the folks in our audience today, as well as our panelists, are applying for that award. Um, so today, our really exciting slot of panelists include Christina Pacheco, um, she is the manager for children, youth, and families for the city of Longmont, Colorado, um, and is a past All-American City Award winner, uh, the city of Longmont. Um, we have Erica Taylor Murth, who's a health commission liaison from Kansas City, Missouri. And we also have Christina Diego, a policy program director for the Seattle Indian Health Board. Um, to get us started this evening, uh, before we get started this evening, just to go over a couple of housekeeping things. One, we ask that you remain muted unless you're speaking or asking questions later on in the session. That's just to make sure that we have the best uh, communication uh, and clarity for everyone who's in the space. Um, we encourage you to hold our questions to the end. If you can't do that, feel free to drop them in the chat, um, but there will be an opportunity at the after the presenters present for you to share questions with them and to ask them more about what's going on into their communities. The webinar is being recorded. If that's not something that you feel comfortable with, you are welcome to keep um, your screen off. Um, and then slides from all of our presenters, as well as the information that I just shared about the Health Equity Award and the All-American Cities uh, program will be emailed to participants after the show. Um, so to get us started, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Christina Diego. Christina? Thanks, Candace. Um, I would like to thank the National Civic League for having me here today. My name is Christina Diego. I'm Mimi and Dene, and I'm a rolled member of the Colville Tribes in Eastern Washington. And I am the current policy program director with the Seattle Indian Health Board. A little bit about the Seattle Indian Health Board is we provide critical health and human services to natives and non-natives in the greater Seattle area. Um, and we also have a research division, the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers across the nation, and the only one with a national purview serving urban natives. Um, so to tell you a little more about my work, um, we specialize in care for the American Indian Alaskan Native population, 
And for over 51 years, we have been specializing in care for the Native population due to high um, social determinants of health within our community. It was really started as an advocacy um, network to improve the health of urban natives as part of the relocation efforts during the 1950s. And today, 60% of our patients are Native, 80% identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Um, and we also provide um, culturally attuned care. And what this means is that we ground ourselves in this model of Indigenous knowledge informed systems of care to deliver integrated and holistic care to Natives and non-Natives. And what makes us different is we provide traditional Indian medicine services to our relatives who are seeking care to tend to their mind, body, and spirit. Um, so some barriers that our community faces right now is a lot of um, our folks are uninsured um, because we are a community health center. And in King County, Washington, um, the Native population makes up 1% of the population, but 15% of the overall homeless population. And so a lot of our relatives are coming to us as unsheltered individuals. So we do have a drop-in center for our elder population. And in our elder population, that's where we're seeing a really high homeless population. Um, during COVID-19, we have had to adjust our healthcare service delivery model. And part of that was creating telehealth um, kiosks within our facility. And that was due to a lot of our relatives being unsheltered. So they didn't have a place to take their telehealth um, medical visits. So we were able to adopt our clinic to provide um, those telehealth services. And we were also able to um, hire some clinical staff to help with um, getting our relatives um, insured. And so what's unique about the Washington state is that American Indians and Alaska Natives have the right to enroll for Medicare um, year long. And other states, you know, there's usually a deadline, but due to federal trust and treaty responsibilities to our community, we're able to register year long. And so a lot of our relatives were just doing education to let them know that they have the right to get access to um, quality um, healthcare services. Another issue that we're seeing is with transportation. And so for a while we were having um, um, transportation available to our relatives, but unfortunately due to grant restrictions, we're just not able to get there right now. So I would say um, transportation is still an area where we're trying to find solutions to get our um, relatives access to our services. Um, during COVID-19 and before, we were partnering with community-based organizations. Um, we're proud to have a satellite clinic downtown um, with a native-led <laughs> native organization called Chief Seattle Club. And they serve um, the urban homeless population here in Seattle. And they recently did um, built an affordable housing development called All All. And so the Seattle Indian Health Board will actually have a medical clinic on the bottom of this affordable housing unit. Um, and we'll be able to provide medical and behavioral health services. And um, so we're looking forward to that, but also here at our clinic, we have traditional Indian medicine practitioners. And what's unique is that our practitioners partner with our providers to integrate our culturally attuned um, traditional Indian medicine services to those who are accessing our mental health or behavioral health services. And so when we expand our clinic to our downtown location, we're going to be able to expand our traditional Indian medicine services. And this is very unique. Um, we actually received a SAMHSA block grant during COVID-19 to implement a first of its kind traditional Indian medicine reimbursement pilot. And so this means so traditionally, um, traditional Indian medicine services are not reimbursable by Medicare or Medicaid. And so part of my policy and advocacy work is to advocate for reimbursement for traditional Indian medicine services. So what the SAMHSA block grant did is we're able to model it and pull money from this block grant to demonstrate that traditional Indian medicine services have a positive health outcome on our relatives. So we're using this model to demonstrate um, the impact of traditional Indian medicine services when it's integrated as part of a holistic care approach for our relatives. So when they come to our access, they're going 
When they come to our clinic, they're going to have access to medical, dental, behavioral health, traditional Indian medicine services, um, and our pharmaceutical services as well. And currently we're also expanding. Um, we're in the process of a capital campaign for our Thunderbird Treatment Center, which is our inpatient behavioral health facility. And we are in the process of currently um, securing capital funds for it, but it's very unique in that the inpatient behavioral health facility will also be integrating our traditional Indian medicine services. And so we'll have a sweat watch on site, which is very unique. Um, we'll also have talking circles, we'll have drumming classes and cultural education classes. And currently in the state of Washington, there's only one culturally attuned inpatient behavioral health facility. And back when our facility was open with outpatient services, I mean inpatient services, we were serving about 25% of the inpatient behavioral health services here in Washington state. And so we're looking forward to getting back and integrating our care for those um, looking for behavioral health because what we're seeing is that our tribal communities, our urban Indian communities and our rural native communities um, they were they are desperately seeking culturally attuned behavioral health services, and we know that we're the right messengers and the right um, type of culturally attuned facility to meet the needs of our um, our relatives. Because what is happening in data is that it's showing that when individuals have access to culturally attuned services, that they are more likely to stay on their treatment plans, and they're more likely to stay um, sober. And so we know that this information is out there and that we just need to have um, appropriate funding. And so what the COVID supplements did is it allowed us to receive that SAMHSA block grant, but COVID supplements also demonstrated um, it historically invested into community-based organizations and Black, Indigenous, and people of color organizations. And COVID supplements were also very flexible. And so they allowed us to invest in the areas that we knew that would best address the needs of our communities. And so we're continuing to advocate for this type of flexible funding because when they restrict our funding, then we're less likely to be able to fund the services that best meet the needs of our relatives. And so part of our policy and advocacy is to advocate for flexible spending and to advocate for less administrative burdens on our providers. And so another thing that's a barrier for us is our providers, um, sometimes the reporting tools required by the federal government are very invasive and they tend to trigger our patients when they're coming in for our behavioral health. And so we're asking for the questions to be less invasive in order to for us to deliver safe um, and trusted um, care to our relatives because we don't wanna be having to ask these questions that harm them, that trigger them. And we know that this model hurts our relatives and we need the federal government to be able to adopt their models in order for us to best serve our community. Um, and I guess what are the next steps for addressing this? for improving behavioral health and mental health within BIPOC communities. I would say um, it's more of what I said about, we need less restrictive funding. We need to lessen the administrative burdens for our providers. And we need to continue to historically invest in our community-based organizations who are trusted me messengers to ensure that our most vulnerable people have access to the behavioral health and mental health care needs. Christina, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, before we turn it over to Erica, our next speaker, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. You use the term relatives quite a bit, um, and if you could potentially maybe uh, expand on that and, and in terms of expanding on that idea of relatives in context of community, or do you mean family members in the sort of traditional sense? And then how has that been, that relationship with community members, with relatives, been really helpful in getting access to care for members of your community? Yeah, so we started using the word relatives when the Seattle Indian Health Board was born from the American Indian Movement. Um, our relatives mean um, our community. So it started with our Native relatives, but it, since then it has grown to natives and non-natives because we want to treat our 
patients like our family. We want to treat them like our community members. We want to treat them like our neighbors. And so that's why we do use the term relatives, because we want to let people know that they are welcomed here, that we see their needs and that we see um, them as an individual. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear from Erica Taylor Murph. Erica. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. Let's be friends um, because a lot of what you said, um, especially around that data gathering, um, that's what we're seeing in Kansas City, too. Like lots of intrusive questions um, directed at, you know, families who are just trying to be healthy and get access to things that make them healthy. So um, I need to remember to get your contact information so that we can keep talking and um, hopefully we can figure out something together. Thank you, Candace, my girl. So um, yeah, I'm Erica Taylor Murr from Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and I am invited here to um, talk about, um, I know we're talking about mental health. Um, I'm presenting our city's community health improvement plan. And the reason why is because um, we, we think about prevention and public health, right? And so if we're really talking about prevention, if we're really getting down to the root of the issue, um, at least here in Kansas City, um, a lot of these mental health issues are stealing from trauma and racism. And so what our community health improvement plan um, is focusing on, and this is the first time that the city of Kansas City has done this, um, they've had community health improvement plans in the past, but they were not focused on racism. And so this one is, um, and it actually kicked off um, here in 2022. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it works. We tested it uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, Y'all see this? Thumbs up, okay. Candace, I keep looking at you because I'm just like, you're my go-to to, okay. So um, I'll go through this. I know I don't have a lot of time with you all, um, but just starting off with the health commission. Um, so the health commission is a mayoral appointed body um, and its overall charge is to um, advise and make recommendations um, to the mayor, city council, city manager, on what the city should do um, to address um, health equities or inequities in Kansas City. Um, what's pretty cool is the health commission was actually chartered um, you know, through a ballot process. Um, city residents voted to have a health commission, um, which means that my job is stable. So um, I'll just kind of get into our community health improvement plan, if that's OK. Um, so again, um, this community health improvement plan um, kicked off um, here in January of 22. Um, it'll go through December of um, 27. And, you know, like I mentioned, you know, this community health improvement plan, it is rooted in racism. Um, I don't know how many of you um, work with community health improvement plans um, or CHIPS. Um, so this slide here just kind of gives an overview um, of what our CHIP um, is geared to do. Um, so identifying those priority health issues in a community. Candace. What? So we're still on the first slide. If you're, I don't yeah. know if you're speaking, yeah. Um, do you remember the bottom right? Um, and then like that, that zoom bar, there you go. Yes. Click this. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? There you go. Okay. You didn't Perfect. miss anything, just a picture. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So um, we have had community health improvement plans in the past. Um, however, they were more so focused on like chronic issues. Um, like high blood pressure, obesity, and, and things like that, that are more so um, calling out like what the outcomes are um, due to uh, health issues that have been happening um, prior to that final sort of outcome. 
And so with this community health improvement plan, like I mentioned, um, we're going to advance health by really identifying um, root causes um, with a focus on racism. Um, and, I, and I will say that with this plan, um, it's really calling out for city leadership to um, enforce the recommendations that are in here, um, just to be clear. Um, uh, a lot of it will require uh, our city manager to work with us, and, and he's really nice, great guy. Um, it'll require him to, to work with us, and, and he's excited to do so. So its focus is really on um, changing those systems and policies, right? Because as we allow them to um, continue on the way that they're going, um, we're going to see more um, impacts of trauma. Um, and if you drill down to it, um, those, uh, you know, trauma that our communities are seeing, it's due to racism. So here's an example. Um, and I know a lot of major cities have this. There's a, there's a zip code that has the highest life expectancy, and then there's a zip code that has um, a lowest life ex expectancy. Um, and so here are our highest and lowest life expectancies in Kansas City. Um, there's a district in Kansas City called the Plaza. If you ever come to visit, hit me up. I'll take you around. Um, but it is predominantly white. It's 93% white. Um, and residents there can expect to live about 90 years old. Um, the crazy thing is, is zip code 64128, it's literally just a couple of miles um, from 64113. Um, and as soon as you sort of cross that threshold, you can expect for uh, residents to live until about 70. Um, and those residents are about 90% black. So almost mirror differences here. Um, and so what this tells us is that opportunities to just live healthy lives are not equal in Kansas City. Um, and as, as a city employee, as a health department employee, as a liaison to the health commission, um, I have a problem with that. And, I, and I'm not the only one here in Kansas City who does. Um, the cool thing about this community health improvement plan is that um, the health commission just can't, you know, write it in collaboration with community partners and then it passes. Um, this had to go through an approval process with our mayor and city council and city manager. Um, so that way it isn't just an organization passing this through. Um, it really brings it to the attention of city leadership um, prior to passage. So um, just kind of getting into a little bit here. Uh, this is sort of the overall mission of this new community health improvement plan. Um, basically, everyone in Kansas City should have the opportunity um, to live healthy lives. So in creation of this plan, right, and again, this is not your typical community health improvement plan, um, at least not for Kansas City. And so um, the health commission um, yes, all of its members are mayoral appointed, um, but the mayor, he actually appointed um, movers and shakers in Kansas City who can really make change happen. Um, someone asked him why he appointed this current um, set of health commissioners, and he said that he wanted to see a little bit of good trouble, and so I'm excited to see uh, him hold up that end. But after you know, some research, lots of surveys and just data collection, looking at different um, systems and policies in Kansas City. Um, the chip um, is, com is compromised of these six um, priority areas. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through, this chip is like maybe 50 pages long. I'm not gonna do that to you guys. I can send you the link, you can look at it. Um, but within these six priority areas, there are recommendations for various systems change um, with sort of a, um, how do you want to call it, almost a guide in how to address racism in these different areas. So, for example, um, we love super wordy slides, right? I'm really sorry. We, we can get you this and you can take some time to read through it. But in essence, this chip is really looking at, yes, we have the six priority areas, 
but what as far as the levels of racism, whether it's systemic, institutional, um, interpersonal and intrapersonal are sort of outside of the scope of this chip because again, this community health improvement plan is more so on systems and policies, right? So what policies are in place in Kansas City that might be perpetuating racism? What institutional policies are in place that might be perpetuating racism? We included interpersonal and intrapersonal racism, just in case maybe an institution comes to us and says, how can we internally, like a doctor to a patient, make sure that we are not continuing to cause trauma to our patients? And so we have this as a guide to make recommendations to them, um, but you're not gonna see a whole lot of interpersonal and intrapersonal recommendations um, in our chip. So this is just sort of where all of this came from, um, so to speak, again, just to keep the focus on racism um, versus trying to go down that path of more um, health outcomes, because we want to keep it to the root where all these issues are coming from. So some key recommendations that um, are in this chip. Um, this isn't all of the recommendations, but I wanted to make sure that I pulled out recommendations that I felt aligned with what we're talking about with you um, here today. Um, it's also a shameless plug because if I know of anyone on this call that's doing this, we're gonna be friends real quick so that we can learn from each other. Um, one key recommendation um, is health and all policies. Some of you have probably heard this before. Some of you might be implementing this in your city. Um, and that's one thing that we wanna do here um, along with budget equity. Um, I've been looking into this um, for our city um, and actually per request of our city manager, um, he's you know anxious to kind of get moving on this also. Um, also, uh, just some other ones that you see listed here. I don't know if I really need to um, read them to you all, um, but I know some key ones, um, a citizen review panel for the Kansas City Police Department. Right now, our department is uh, really has a magnifying glass on it right now. And so it's a really great opportunity for us to work with our police department um, to see how um, we can help them work on better behalf of our residents. Um, another one, um, eliminating source of income discrimination. Um, this is actually in our housing section um, of the chip because what we've come to find out is you know, there could be folks out there that, you know, they're making income and it might not be traditional. Um, so let's not traumatize our residents that have income, they can afford the rent, but because they're being asked to identify sources and provide and provide all this documentation, um, that can, that can, you know, basically cause more harm um, than it does good. Um, a key one that I'm really excited, I'm excited about all of them, but um, crime prevention through environmental design. Um, if I, I'm not gonna go back to the slide where it compares the zip codes, but just thinking about that, um, the zip code with the highest life expectancy, um, you could almost get a drone and just kind of look down um, onto the plaza and you can just see how um, that area is built to really, um, prohibit crime from happening. Um, and then you can just go a couple of miles down the way and you can take that same picture and see how structure is not in place um, that prohibits crime from happening. And so when you have an environment that really allows for violence to happen and just perpetuate perpetuates trauma, like all these areas that we've talked about, um, it really will impact mental health. And that's what we're getting to, right? It's preventing um, mental health issues as much as we can. We're not going into genetics or anything like that, but just environmentally and, and structurally um, doing the best that we can as a city on behalf of our people um, to eliminate um, you know, mental health and, and what's causing 
um, trauma where mental health is really stemming from. Um, so I, I don't want to belabor this at all. I want to be respectful of time. Um, so that's all I have. I don't know how we want to do questions or anything like that, but um, I'm going to put my email in the chat for you all to, to reach out. And I hope you do um, because we got a lot of work to do. So I want to learn from those who um, are doing this work already, which is a lot of you. So I'll just stop talking there. Yeah, so I'm going to just ask you one question, then I'm going to go ahead and turn it on to uh, Christina Pacheco. Um, but so is is the sort of approach of Kansas City that they that you or at least of Erica Taylor Murph that you believe that um, racism is informing uh, experiences with um, in access to mental health care um, and that to provide greater access to mental health care for folks in your community that the city must address racism, which is something that you seek to do through the chip, right? And it's results in outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, let me be clear. Um, I, I don't believe that these systems and policies are in place um, with the heart to perpetuate racism, if that makes sense. A lot of times changing systems and policies, um, it's hard, you know, because then you're you're looking at city code and you're having to do all these changes so it can be overwhelming um the stance that the health commission has is you know we're here to help um and so once other city leadership sort of understand that um you know i i was amazed at how quickly they were wanting to okay let's meet let's start figuring this out now um so yes absolutely by Im by implementing the recommendations that are in the chip we expect to see declines in um, the need for mental health resources, um, but then also um, other needs that are the result from um, inequitable policies and practices. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, yeah. Christina Pacheco. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the wonderful presentations. Um, I am going to share my screen. Let me get to my PowerPoint. There we go. <clears throat> there. Is everybody seeing that? Okay, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so as Candace said, I'm Christina Pacheco. I've been with the city of Longmont. Um, for 23 years, it's a wonderful place, um, wonderful place to be. Um, I manage the Children, Youth and Families Division. Um, we provide prevention and intervention services for children, youth and families. Uh, really, our role is to leverage community uh, resources and really look at filling service gaps uh, within, within the community and really partner with the community to, um, to fill those service gaps. Uh, we work in five different uh, focus areas. Really, our foundation is youth development. We also provide parent engagement. We have an early childhood focus area. We have a focus area that's pretty nimble as far as uh, our work with the community. We do community problem solving. Currently, we're working on uh, juvenile diversion and uh, looking at how we can um, really address the uh, uh, racial and ethnic disparity uh, amongst uh, um, our um, youth of color within our, our court system. So that's a, that's a, a big area that we're working in. Uh, apart from that, we also uh, have community uh, mental health. And that really is, as uh, Erica talked about, kind of interwoven through all of the all of the areas that, that we work in. Um, you know, that that can't go. Uh, that really is part of of addressing uh, uh, food security. It's part of uh, of every area that we work in parenting, parenting with youth. Um, we, uh, in our community mental health, it really is about uh, working with our population that is uninsured, underinsured, has barriers to transportation, and really focusing on, um, on the individuals that um, really, really need the, the services. Um, when you take a look at Longmont, we are a little under uh, 100,000. 
um, people. Uh, the uh, majority of our population um, is um, is uh, is 18 and over. 68% white, non-Hispanic. Um, <clears throat> when you take a look at our county as a whole, about 21% of um, our uh, population is Hispanic Latino. Um, when you look at our uh, poverty le level, um, that's where when you dig into it a little more, um, we have about 8.2% that lives at 100% of poverty level and then 6.5% that um, is at 149% uh, of the poverty level. Um, how that uh, really impacts uh, the, the um, work around mental health uh, advocacy is that um, when you look at um, uh, our county, it really is a, a county where you have um, families that, that, have, uh, that are resource rich, that have, um, uh, that have um, uh, resources that can that can pay for services that that really have their their needs met and then you have a segment of the community that that um, does does not have that um, in addition to um, um, to that we have had um, you know of course everybody has dealt with uh, COVID-19 but we have had some other natural disasters that have happened we've had some uh, several wildfires in in our community. We've had a King Super shooting. Um, there have been we have been impacted in in many many different ways. Um, our what we learned through COVID nineteen is that there has uh, there was a disproportionate impact um, on our uh, our uh, Black Indigenous people of color um, in terms of access to uh, teletherapy. Um, and technology resources. We found that many of um, our mental health providers went uh, virtual. Uh, and when that happened, um, our, uh, specifically our Latino population, the biggest um, percentage of our population did not have um, access to technology um, for that purpose and then also um, for uh, educational uh, purposes as well. So we, um, through grant funds, uh, we're able to secure um, uh, secure technology. Um, we have within our city structure, um, Longmont Next Light uh, internet services, and so we were able to um, to provide some some needed uh, both internet uh, and devices um, to as many people as as we could um, through through that um, process as well. Um, some of the barriers to access, uh, just statewide, our safety net system is really unable to meet the needs of, of people experiencing crisis. Um, our walk-in uh, center in Boulder um, had to decrease uh, the hours that they were open. Just nationwide, there's a shortage of mental health providers. Um, and then it really is um, compounded, as I mentioned, um, by the the need that was doubled by uh, our Marshall Fire, um, and then the uh, the needs through through the the pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, we're located in a in a well resourced area. Sometimes when we apply for um, grant funds, it's like, oh, that you're you're Boulder County. You're you're well resourced. Um, when you take a look at that um, at that need, however, and you look at the the uh, segment of the population that really is well resourced, and then you look at the segment of the population that is li that is living um, way below poverty level. Therein lies the lies the great disparity that that we need to that we need to examine and, and really look at. Um, let me see. My slide is not changing. There we go. Um, we, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the at the outset of the presentation, um, way back in in. Um, you know, when I first started with the city, um, we had a process called Focus on Longmont. And I really think that that changed the trajectory for 
um, how our government uh, involved uh, community members. It was called Focus on Longmont. Um, and I just feel really fortunate to have been um, a part of that work because that really, um, at, the, at the outset of uh, my career, kind of shaped um, and set the expectation for um, my uh, engagement with the community. Um, it really is uh, about, and, and you know, we are expected to um, engage the community in um, problem solving and in um, how we are going to work together to, um, to um, you know, tackle some of these really, really difficult issues. Um, and so uh, we pulled together after um, after some really tragic um, events, some uh, murder suicides within within our our community, pulled together um, supporting action for for mental health. Sam, um, it was a group of uh, community members, uh, government, nonprofits. Um, um, uh, religious organizations, um, we pulled together uh, these uh, groups and talked about how can we uh, destigmatize mental health, how can we get um, get uh, people talking about uh, supporting each other, about getting into uh, treatment counseling if necessary, um, how, how can we just create that support system? Um, as a result of that, um, there were, um, you know, several thousand people that were um, that were trained in mental health first aid. Um, there um, have been several uh, ongoing community conversations that happen in uh, within within schools. Um, there, uh, this has actually been replicated now um, through the COVID-19 uh, pan pandemic and kind of as we're uh, hopefully coming out of it. Um, the county has now uh, replicated this plan and, and uh, we, have, we have turned this over to them um, through, the, um, through their ARPA, ARPA work. Um, we, uh, um, they are now uh, uh, using our facilitators of, of mental health first aid um, to train county, countywide. Um, and so now instead of our facilitators um, just training within Longmont, now that's happening countywide and we have a, a team of facilitators that is that is doing that is doing this work. Um, so out of something small, we now have something that's happening that's happening countywide. Um, let's see. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the successes uh, when we started SAM, um, we really had that focus on um, cultural brokers doing the work. Um, so bilingual, bicultural um, individuals uh, uh, talking about de de destigmatizing mental health, um, getting support. There's that focus on equity that, uh, that Erica talked about. Um, we now, uh, for the past two years uh, in our budgetary process, have a, a measurement uh, in our programs that uh, asks about equity. Now it's not just about the number of people served within our programs, but it's about how are you addressing equity. And so our city manager and finance director really take a, a look at that. And so it's weighted um, against that as well. Um, we, as I mentioned, leverage the work with, that we do um, countywide, uh, and we keep the 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 one of the one of the challenges. However, is how do we keep that work going? Um, you know, when you do this work uh, day to day, when it's your career, um, it's easy to keep the work going. Um, when you have a group of volunteers, they often get involved in their own lives. They kind of uh, go off and 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 sometimes don't don't keep it going. So so it's always a struggle for staff. You know how do we keep it fresh? How do we keep people involved? Um, funding is always an issue. It, it's an issue for us. Um, as I talked about, uh, coming from a, a you know an area that can sometimes be looked at as as um, you know well resourced. Um, how do you how do you paint that picture? Um, and how do you show that? You know, yes, uh, we are well resourced. We have a, a, a strong tax base. However, there is a segment of the population that is far away from that 
well-resourced, well-resourced base. Um, and then finally, um, you know, some of the uh, uh, upcoming um, uh, things that we're working on, you know, we're continuing in recovery. Um, we <clears throat> had, we were still uh, working on some major flood recovery when COVID-19 hit. So it seems like since, uh, I don't know, we've been in recovery probably for, um, seems like the last 10 years. Um, we're also working on uh, early childhood and mental health. That's a big area for us. How do we get um, mental health providers within early childhood organizations? We realize that's a need. Um, how do we get them supported? How do we get, um, how do we get um, services earlier? Um, that's something that, that we, um, that we're really uh, looking at um, and, and uh, developing. How do we get culturally appropriate services earlier? Um, and then the other piece that we are looking at kind of internally with our own division, within our own division and the providers that, that we have um, from that community mental health perspective is um, just ongoing parent support groups. Um, how do we provide that support structure for parents um, and maximize the, um, the resources that we have so that um, we don't tie up any one clinician in individual, um, individual therapy um, when we might be able to support more individuals in a group setting. So that's kind of what we've been we've been playing with. I think that's my last. Yeah, that's my last slide. So. Yeah, Christina, I thank you. I thank you. Stop. OK, there. Stop sharing. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. So now we've got 10 minutes left. This is when we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions that you may have of our presenters. Um, I know that we already got one in the chat that I saw from um, Tamika, um, and that was to Erica. Tamika, I don't know if you wanted to unmute and ask that question or if you wanted me to ask that question for you. So, um, it, okay, so uh, the question that Tamika had for Erica is what type of organization or at what level of organization within a community uh, comes up with a community health improvement plan? What's funny is that Kansas City has a couple. Um, so the city of Kansas City, which is um, basically local government, um, we create ours, uh, the, you know, manage the not the manager but the mayor sort of put that responsibility on the health commission to do um i know one of our local hospitals they have a community health improvement plan so i'm i i can't even tell you like who makes that decision to do one um my guess is that any organization could really create one if they wanted to um and I, I'm not sure if, you know, it would, you know, if whatever organization will want to go through the formal um, process for adoption, um, for example, like going through the mayor, city council, city manager, um, and actually getting that approved in that way. But I think any organization could really write one if they wanted to. Thank you so much, Erica. The next question comes from Raul. Um, the question he asked uh, is, have any of the programs featured today included a significant component that addresses language access? Um, I'm really interested in collaborating with someone who, or with those who are. So Christina or Christina Diego. Ready? Yeah, language access as far as, um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on that Raul? Uh, yes, in terms of mental health, right, kind of serving the mental health needs of, right. of um, folks who don't speak English yet. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, I can speak for um, our, our um, the positions I have. 
um, prior to my taking the, the position um, of manager, um, the uh, clinician positions were not required to be bilingual. Um, and so I changed that um, and uh, they are now required um, to be uh, Spanish speaking. So um, I, there are two um, bilingual clinicians on uh, our team. And so that is definitely a positive and it's a resource. However, um, when any one of our clinicians leaves, um, it's very, very difficult um, to, to hire. Um, it can take a really long time. Um, the positions have been open um, up to, uh, I wanna say uh, one position was open like 18 months. Um, and so it takes a while to, uh, to fill them um, because of the lack of uh, resources in that area. Um, the other piece is that the city, uh, to kind of help with that across the board, um, the city um, implemented a, a bilingual differential, um, uh, uh, so pay. So there's that uh, pay equity um, across the board, um, and then there was an increase um, to that pay because there hadn't been an increase for a while. So I think that there's two pieces to that. Um, one. Uh, I think organizations need to look at what key positions need to be bilingual. Um, and then two, um, what is the uh, pay equity uh, around that? Hi, Raul. I would say that we haven't started any type of um, materials that are available in other languages, but that's something that we have identified because we want to start producing um, health education campaigns that are available in different languages because we have also um, reviewed our population in our area and we know that a large um, percentage of our community is refugees and so we want to start creating documents that um, provide our services in different languages but also provide health education for the most um, the most pressing health issues in our community. Okay, um, we have a couple more questions. Um, one is from Anna, um, is, is there a coalition as a collective that can take this to Washington? Because although our community politicians are well aware of the delicacies that make this situation very delicate. Um, and so uh, Anna, you're welcome to take yourself off mute. Um, it seems like the question is, is how do we collectively as a community advocate for better or increased ac access for mental health care? Um, I know that I saw Christina Diego responding in the chat talking about um, making telehealth access permanent, um, but I guess how do we, not as folks who aren't physicians, but just as community members become better advocates um, and get our politicians to listen? And I guess that's for Christina Diego or Christina Pacheco or for Pacheco or for Erica. Yeah, it, it's, it's um, basically a question for everyone because I think everyone had key, um, key communication on every level as I am a part of um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we do a lot of community health work down here. I've been in community health work since 2017 and we face the same inaccuracies in our community facing um, a lot of the youth. Um, criminal justice behind a lot of the plagues from poverty and racism and different things of that nature. So um, it's basically going across the board. And that's why the question was um, the, a lot of the commission, a lot of the community leaders, they are aware of the uh, tragedies and the triumphs that the community is facing. Um, we have community gardens that um, are not really up and running like they should, because I think that there's a lot of, um, there's, a lot of inconsistencies in the community as far as politicians and also a part of um, somewhat as the residents because in a sense I can say something about the residents because you're not going to stay there all day and watch a carrot grow. So, you know, when it comes down to eating, <laughs> you can wait a day or two, but at a day or two it's over. 
Um, but definitely, um, I look forward to, I was actually invited, someone sent me the information and I said, yeah, this seems like something that I would be interested in. And in the back of my head, you can see my organization back here, it says value my vision because um, I also am a strong candidate um, as a parent and um, community health worker who knows and experience much on mental health. So definitely um, I have as some emails and some information I've taken notes to actually take back to my workplace because we actually have a program here called the Healing Space that we're getting ready to do between two organizations, the Crockett Foundation and uh, CBCI, which is Community Based Connections. I'm here at the office now, but um, definitely I look forward to actually speaking more on this situation if we can find a way to create a coalition that would be great. But if not, um, whatever we can do, I'm here. Hi, Anna. As a nonprofit, I would say we have a couple approaches to meeting with our legislators. So first, I would say, even though you don't like working with your local legislators, you're still going to have to partner with them because they're the ones who are going to be advocating for your community. And I would say that you're on the right path because as a constituent, they need to be listening to your voices. And so I would say that you need to identify the legislators um, in your local government, your county, and then your state and then identify the other nonprofits in your community who are also um, working towards the same efforts that you are. And then something that we do here at the Seattle Indian Health Board is that we um, conduct lobby days. And so we um, gather materials. So we create um, like a, a sheet of our priorities and our briefings. So, and then we make connections with the um, legislative assistance for the offices that we advocate to. Um, and then we go about uh, uh, making scheduling appointments with each, each of the offices and the offices that you're going to outreach to, you're going to want to meet with those that, um, of which district you live in, but you're also going to identify the legislators in your state who are focused on behavioral health. And so you're going to put together materials um, of your um, positions and then you can also create like a handouts for them to review because they need to do that like it's their job to listen to us and so once you are able to schedule those meetings with them and then build a collective of maybe there's a behavioral health group already uh, maybe there's a caucus in your state and then just identify those and start outreaching to them but you're on the right path I was taught that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So the more you can beat them with the same mess, I shouldn't have said that. The more you can um, tell them the same message uh, repeatedly, um, I've been told that that's really helpful. So I'm gonna sneak in one last question and then before we wrap up, um, today and and I because I think this is a great question to end on um, and this question was for Alex and they asked um, how are you being transparent about the steps that you are taking to achieve equity and keeping the public up to date with the outcomes as you see your work achieving equity in our community and so that's really a great question to wrap up on if each of you want to just you know answer briefly but how are we doing our best to like make the public aware of the work all the amazing work that all of you are doing Um, I guess I can start and we can do a better job on making the public aware. Um, we've honestly gotten away from that because we decided to focus on um, just getting the system changed. Um, it's almost like helping someone without uh, telling them that you're helping them. It's more so stopping what's hurting them. Um, so we don't do a good job of letting the public know, hey, this is what we've done. Um, we'd rather focus our energy on just making those changes happen um, in collaboration with, you know, city leadership. I would say here at Seattle Indian Health Board and the Urban Indian Health Institute, we try to post things on our social media. So that's on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And um, part of our policy and advocacy is we try to post as much as we can on LinkedIn, even though there hasn't been a lot of movement lately because of what's happening at the federal government. But I would say that we always try to share what we're the amazing work that we're doing. And then um, we also try to share what our community organizations are also doing. 
for us um, around budget equity, um, it's all public record. So any um, scores that we give our programs, um, it is, uh, you know, anybody can anybody can look um, look those up if there are any questions. And then um, from the community involvement perspective, we always um, we always uh, involve uh, community members in in any of those efforts, and that kind of stems from the focus on long run on long run work. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And a special, special thank you to Christina Pacheco, Erica Taylor Murph, and Christina Diego. We will be sending an email, a follow up email to all of our participants and attendees today um, with the resources, the slides, and links uh, for any of the information that was shared. Uh, this email will also include a brief survey, like two or three questions. So if you could also answer that, um, which will give you an opportunity to give us new ideas about future webinars, we'd also be grateful. Um, with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us.